my privilege and honor to be here this evening to present to you on a very political topic, strengthening the historical, cultural, and economic linkages of Africa. The three areas are all intertwined and they all influence each other. So, the point I want to start off making to you is that my presence here, your presence here, hinges on the lives that we lost in terms of the transatlantic slave trade, in terms of the slave experience, in terms of those who escaped slavery, you know, Maroons in Jamaica, Maroons in Suriname, and wherever, whichever part that was the occurrence. Also, according to Van Sidney Miner's book, uh, they came before Columbus. He mentioned that right here in Columba, off the island of Cartagena, the Spanish first came in contact with blacks, even before the so-called first people being the Amerindians. So, I'm saying to you that those leaders who led slave rebellions made a telling contribution in terms of ensuring that we have survived today. All right? When the literature speaks about uh, abolitionists, I think they are downgrading that the, the, the people who were enslaved very vociferously and forcefully made the point that they were not satisfied with being subjugated with such a condition. So I'm saying we must pay homage and be thankful for their efforts in terms that we can survive and continue making a contribution to life. Now, within the sphere of this contribution, it goes beyond the mere uh, resistance and the slave plantation. It also takes into consideration people who have been activists in this process and who have been academics who have researched and tried to paint a picture in terms of the Africa's contribution to the world. So these pictures here, George Patmore, Trail Guardian, uh, C.L.R. James, Paul Mogul, a leader of a slave rebellion in Jamaica, and Mr. Sylvester, these three Trail Guardians played leading roles in organizing Pan-African Congresses that took place in London, all right? So, and they also wrote extensively in terms of the Pan-Africanist movement, and they worked very closely with Kwame Nkrumah, the first president of Ghana. So we need to recognize their contributions. Henry Christophe, Tosin Laverture, Christopher de Salaire, Spetia is not there, are very significant in the African world, in the sense that they were prime leaders in the Haitian Revolution between 1791 and 1804, where their efforts contributed to Haiti being declared the first black republic in the Western Hemisphere. And so sad today, after such a telling contribution, they have paid a hefty price and is considered the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. But those efforts must be recognized. So in terms of the historical connection, their contributions and our existence are inextricably linked. Here's the last thing on the invitation of the first Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago, Dr. Eric Williams, visited Trinidad and Tobago in 1969. That is also a historical link. The picture here of this lady in the hand, she was a female soldier in Zimbabwe, and she was executed by the British because of her fierce resistance to what they were subjected to. And she was honored in that every section of the army they had a behind the section name in her honor. So even the females played a role in terms of that historical link and our survival today. Excellent. Right. Dr. Joseph Ben Jokanan was a former lecturer at Cornell University. He was an Egyptologist. And I had the pleasure as a 14-year-old to benefit from his wisdom and knowledge in the year 1978 in Trinidad and Tobago. And he was one of the foremost scholars in terms of black scholarship. 
along with all of these other guys here, Dr. Ivan Van Sertima, Dr. Chi, Antia Diop, Dr. Walter Rodney Agani from the Caribbean, who made a very telling contribution himself, and he wrote a classic book called How Europe Underdeveloped Africa. He lived only 38 years, but his work lives on. So too, these outstanding scholars, they are gone, but their work still live on in terms of creating that enlightenment of the experiences of African people in this part of the world. Right, Dr. Chancellor Williams, another foremost scholar, author of a book, a very scholarly uh, book called The Destruction of Black Civilization. And those two guys here still living have contributed extensively in Trinidad and Tobago and across the diaspora in terms of writing about the African experience. All right? Right, so looking at that historical link, you know, many scholars have identified the various fossil findings that have been formed in the African continent, and the, the science combined with those findings have made the indisputable statement that the birthplace of man is definitely the African continent. And the science of paleoanthropology and molecular biology intertwined with the historical evidence give confirmation to that fact. The Greek historian Diodorus Siculus, who lived at the time of the Roman Emperor, he also observed that Africans were older than any other nation. So I'm saying the, the science and the, the work of the researchers all combined together is making that presentation. So whether you are African or non-African, we are all linked, right? So when we talk about the connection, do not feel that you are outside of the loop. So when we talk about historical, cultural, and economic linkages, it is diasporic, it is national, it is global, because once you have connection, no matter your ethnic origin, and given the fact that you are all connected anyhow, you are part of that process and that connection. So, in the Caribbean here, all right, in the, in the Americas as a whole, you know, the experience of the transatlantic slave experience, the, the word that is not so much used, but that conveys the fullness of what that experience was like, is the Swahili word meaning uh, the Mahafa, meaning a tra the tragedy of unimaginable proportion. So some writers have indicated that between 28 and 42 million Africans were enslaved between 1480 and 1880. And of course, because of the conditions on the slave ship and all that they went through, other writers have said only about 10 to 13 million landed in the Americas. So the low figures definitely, according to Rodney, are cited in Ume, were due to the many who died, the many who suffered otherwise, resulting in a decline in terms of the numbers taken out of Africa and the numbers actually arriving. So we must be very thankful those who survived gave um, credit to the fact that we are here today to be participating in this conference and making our contribution to life in different ways. Right, so we can say, we, we can say that the, the bulk of those who came as slaves Birthing the African population of the Caribbean, Latin America, and of course, as I mentioned before, those who escape also will be contributors to our existence. Let's go to the next one. Right, so this statement here our historical connection constitutes an indisputable link to our evolution. Let us recognize those who fought in Africa at the onset of the Mahafa because. As they entered the continent, you had people in Guinea Bissau and other parts, they resisted. Right? On the plantation, they resisted. Right? And you have had academics doing the research, other writers also making their contribution. So we need to give credence and recognition to those contributions. Right. So there's a lot of information here. The fundamental point I am making is that. Whether it was Africa, whether it was America, or the Caribbean, you had various individuals taking a stand and making the point that a human being 
should not be subjected to those conditions of living. On the slave ship, you had the slave, Ulado Ipriano, who the Portuguese called Gustaf, Gustafas Vasas, highlighted the horrendous conditions that existed. So all of those individuals have been significant contributors. Right? In terms of the Caribbean context, Paul Bodo in Jamaica was a slave rebellion leader. I mentioned what Christophe and two celebrated already. Kofi in Guyana, Daga in China and Tobago, Fedon in Grenada, Sandy in Tobago. They contributed by opposing and leading various slave rebellions to ensure that we can exist today. So I'm saying, let us remember them, let us honor them, and let us understand that our contribution now is very much dependent, depending on what they did. Next one. Right, so George Pardon, Henry Sylvester Williams, and C.L.R. James, as I mentioned to you before, played a leading role in the Pan-Africanist movement. And this gentleman here, in my humble view, Marcus Mosias Garvey, who only lived for 53 years between 1887 and 1947 and 1940. This gentleman, in my view, epitomized the, the topic I'm speaking about here in that he was able to, to set up the UNIA called the Universal Negro Improvement Association that had branches in South America, North America, in Asia, in Africa, and his idea was that the diaspora and those in Africa must view themselves as one. So the intent of this presentation very much dovetails into the advocacy of Marcus Garvey while he lived. Some very important um, concepts he advocated, repatriation, I know that's a big talk now, self-reliance, uh, commerce, entrepreneurship, all right? The, the scholars, the women leaders, you can flip the next slide for the point that's been made here, right? So the collective effort on multiple fronts by different players, academic and non-academic, continues today. In the academic side, for the first time in 2001, scholars got together, where they looked at the experience of the Mahafa and they came up with a title called Fighting Back African Strategies Against the Slave Trade. And then two years later, they produced a book edited by Dr. Sylvia Diouf entitled Fighting the Slave Trade, West African Strategies. So from the plantation to academia, the process is still being advanced. Right. Now, if you go to a doctor, what is the first thing the doctor will ask of you? If you go to a doctor, for the first time. Anyone? If you go to a doctor for the first time, what is a fundamental question they will ask, or questions that they will ask? Anyone? What is your illness? What is your illness? And then they will also have to get a sense of your history. So you cannot separate yourself from your history. That is why the late great Malcolm X said that a people without a history is a dead people. All right? So if you want to continue to be alive in our contribution, we cannot separate ourselves from our history. And the fact that the African Union has made the diaspora, the sixth region of Africa, solidify the correctness of this paper in strengthening the historical, cultural, and economic linkages in Africa. So wherever you are in the diaspora, this is our official position and has been adopted by the African Union probably about 10 years now. All right? So again, just to summarize, you know, in terms of Gavi, who I highlight as a, a leading figure, you know, and his impact, you have people who are, would have opposed his ideas in terms of his politics, but others or everyone were very clear that in terms of his ideas, in terms of economic cooperation, that they should be supported. So according to Thomas, I cited in Lewis 1987, we entertain no doubts whatever in the soundness of his doctrine of worldwide cooperation among Negroes for the economic 
and industrial upliftment. All right? So, Gavi had a political ideology, some didn't agree, but his economic ideology, whether you were elitist or not, whether you were in Africa or not, they saw the wisdom in it. As you know, he would not have been as successful in, in some of his projects as the newspaper, as the shipping project, but his ideas are very much relevant today as they were when he advocated them. What can be done going forward? Let me talk about strengthening relations uh, in the context of the Americas. A reliable air and sea bridge will accelerate because once people are moving and interacting, there will be a better cementing of relationships, there will be a better exchange of information. But as it stands today, if you travel out of the Caribbean, there isn't any direct flight from the Caribbean to Africa. So depending on which part of Africa you are going, you might be traveling at least 20 hours per, or perhaps in two days, all right? However, traveling out of uh, New York, according to Camara 2005, to Dhaka, Senegal, a direct flight will take you six and a half hours. In the context of Trinidad and Tobago, the east coast of Trinidad and Tobago lies in the direct part of Africa. A brother of mine who works in Africa regularly, when he travels to Nigeria, oftentimes the different flight routes he has to take, takes about two days before he reaches. Right? A direct flight will significantly reduce that time. Right? When we think about the sea bridge, the sea bridge in terms of the transatlantic slave experience brought a lot of pain. All right? However, Van uh, Zetima in his book They Came Before Columbus and also Kamara in his book Tribute to African Civilization identifies that the Mandigos and the Malay people of the Sakai empires, they crossed the Atlantic and succeeded in establishing colonies throughout the Americas. That relationship must be strengthened now on the basis of mutual respect and understanding and in terms of supporting each other in becoming stronger and not from the point of view of imperialist control. Right, so as the interaction continues through the uh, improved ANC bridge, you know, visit the historical site, both in the diaspora, both in the continent, in terms of uh, the place of Norito and many people from the Caribbean and the Americas, when they visit such sites, they feel a connection, even though it has been so many centuries after that they are visiting. All right? Another important thing, we live in a technological world. So besides the ANC bridge, you know, information technology is also a medium where we can communicate and share information. All right? We can also look at the establishment of an African Global Television Network, highlighting key historical and cultural information, um, exploring economic pos uh, possibilities in terms of the oil and gas sector, culture example, and having appropriate museums where uh, the history and the artifacts can be recorded, documentaries can be shown, where we seek to strengthen that relationship in a manner to give people a sense of strength if they didn't have that knowledge and foundation from before. All right, so on the cultural side, I will be more uh, kind of practical in this one, in that culture is very broad, culture is a, a total way of life, but in the context of my presentation, I will just look at it in the, con in, in the context specifically of the performing side of culture, all right? So in the Caribbean, we have Carnival in Trinidad, we have Carnival in other uh, Caribbean islands, we have Reggae, Sunsplash in Jamaica. So the population of the continent is about 1 billion. If we strengthen the historical and cultural relationship, there's a basis for us to sell our major fe festivals to the continent and try to encourage them to come. As it stands today, most of the people who participate in our major festivals will be coming out of North America and Europe. By forging this linkage, we will be creating a market whereby our festivals, our cultural festivals, can provide a, a better economic platform and strength to our countries, all right? So the possibility of setting up carnival events in every African country, there are 55 African countries. Uh, when you think of African Liberation Day, uh, the 25th of May, 1963, 
That was the date when the Organization of African Unity was established, now called the African Union. So it's a significant day, and it's a day that should be observed in all parts of the diaspora, highlighting the history, highlighting the culture, and exploring possibilities for becoming one nation. The African Union has made the pronouncement that we are part of the continent by making us the sixth region. So there's no, there should be no shame, there should be no fear whatsoever in terms of feeling part of this experience. All right? Promoting and developing the, con the, the concept of the Calypso tent in Africa. Through the slave experience, Calypso emerged. All right? the, the, the concept of double Antoine and Calypso, where they were saying one thing and meaning something else, all emerged out of the slave experience. So there's a historical link, and that link must be extended from the source of which it comes in terms of the promotion of its development, not only in the diaspora, but in the African continent. So the cultural association can give rise to economic possibilities. So joint ventures with Calypsonians, steel band players, mass men, cultural entrepreneurs, producers, composers, song engineering personnel, etc., can provide not only cultural solidarity, but money generating possibilities. In 2015, we have a live example. We had some leading steel bands out of Trinidad and Tobago with good Desperados, BP Renegades, Trinidad Osters that participated in the Abuja and Calabar Carnivals. All right? So there is also that recent experience, and with a, a population mass of 1 billion and such promotion. These guys can, you know, enjoy a kind of economic uh, sustenance and strength that they never even envisage if it is properly marketed and promoted. All right. Of course, on the academic side, we need to have researchers researching uh, the cultural experiences of our people. For example, in Trinidad and Tobago, there are a lot of derivatives of the Yoruba language that many people use unconsciously without even recognizing. But we need to apply academic research to that phenomenon in terms of giving people a fuller understanding of that connection. So words like eh, uh -huh, uh -huh, nana, all of these are derivative from the Yoruba language that people commonly use in Trinidad and Tobago. All right? Right, I mentioned about the, group, the Global African Television Network, so we can skip to the next slide. Right. On the economic front, Trinidad Tobago has been involved in oil production since 1857. All right? That is 162 years of experience in the oil sector. All right? Informally, there are a number of professionals in the oil and gas sector from Trinidad Tobago and other parts of the Caribbean who work in Africa. So what we have here is a, a possibility of merging the the presence of oil and gas in Africa, Africa has about 8% in terms of oil reserves in the world and about 9.3% in terms of gas reserves. So you have a marriage that is possible between the massive experience of Trinidad and Tobago and the presence of oil and gas in reasonably significant quantities in Africa. All right? So these are some of the ideas here. Uh, the expertise gained, as I mentioned, time. Right. Two more minutes. Two more minutes. So this can be shared with a number of emerging countries in Africa. I mentioned about the number of locals employed in Germany. Recently in Trinidad and Tobago, we had a situation where the major oil company, every single worker, was retrenched. When you combine the service personnel, they're talking about 15,000 employees. So we have a pool of highly skilled and experienced workers where that talent pool can be leveraged in terms of being exported and sold to African countries. We also have the experience where we have had uh, understanding of the legal infrastructure in terms of contractual arrangements with the multinational corporation operating in Trinidad and Tobago. That expertise can also be shared with African countries. Right? A study delivered in March 2006 identified energy services as Trinidad and Tobago only really internationally competitive service industry. Hence the reason my focus was on the oil and gas sector. Next slide. All right. 
The local market in Trinidad and Tobago has been consistent over this called trade liberalization, where inter international companies, oil companies, with huge capital bases have been involved in the oil and gas sector. When you talk about the oil and gas sector, you are talking about billions of dollars, which most developing countries cannot put out. The problem is the terms and conditions of the arrangement. As you know, multinational corporations, they, they do not love your country as you will love it. So you need the experience in terms of the kind of agreements that will be signed to ensure that the best economic advantage is attained. All right? We can capitalize on the good relations that exist among member states of the African Union, such as Ghana and Nigeria, their embassies in Trinidad. Um, Jamaica has established formal relations with the African Union. All right? And within the recent past, there have been keen interests shown by a number of African states, for example, Burundi, Botswana, etc., in terms of exploring how they can go with the local energy sector. There's also a visit in 2005-2006 in terms of um, training being provided to Nigerian and Ugandan students. All right? Right, so I mentioned those figures before. I mentioned about the joint arrangement that we can pursue. All right? um, I mentioned about the kind of finances that are involved in terms of oil. And as I said, the key thing is the nature of the agreements. Yeah, next slide. That we, all right? Right, so, wrap up in about what, two minutes? Sure. Right, right, so very quickly, in terms of the oil and gas sector, at the, what you call the upstream level, before you exploit for oil and, oil and gas, you need to do seismic surveys, very costly, all right? So after doing it and you identify that oil is present, the spill-off opportunities will come from the various forms of equipment that we will use in terms of drilling for the oil. On the downstream side, people will be involved in terms of logistics, people will be involved in terms of the legal department, the human resource department, it provides those kind of possibilities. So in concluding, I would like to tell you that the historical, cultural and economic linkages with Africa there is a, a base already in place. Strengthening that base will only make it better for people of the African diaspora and people outside of it. For example, trade among African countries represents about 12% of trade. With North America, 24%, and with Europe, 64%. These statistics are according to the World Trade Council. The African Union is trying to make Africa a stateless kind of entity by 2063 where a passport will allow you to operate anywhere in the African Union. So if it, if it becomes borderless, it means to stay, it will contribute to increasing trade, cultural integration, and it will abound, abound in the benefit to all those who live in the, in the continent and in the diaspora and the African Union has given that platform by ensuring that we are known as the sixth region of Africa. Also in terms of the philosophy of Marcus Garvey, when he said one aim, one destiny, one Africa, I think this paper attempted to make that point. So thank you for listening, and I trust that the various ideas will have given you some insight as to how that historical, cultural, and economic linkage is possible. Thank you.